Welcome to Word for the Weekend. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is James Jacob Prash, coming to you for RTN, Christian TV in Scotland, and also Moriel TV. We're looking tonight at the teaching, Set the Trumpet to Thy Lips. It was, of course, a book by David Wilkerson some years ago, Set the Trumpet to Thy Mouth, but essentially just Amos, uh, from, from the book of Amos, chapter 8, verse 1. Let's begin there at Amos chapter 8, verse 1, as our launching point. I'm sorry, the book of Hosea, the book of Hosea. Put the trumpet to your lips. Like an eagle, the enemy comes against the house of the Lord. Because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. Now, this is very interesting in its historical setting. Hosea was the only indigenous prophet from the 10 northern tribes from Israel. Israel was going into the Assyrian captivity. But looking way beyond that, Looking from his time, which was 720 BC, looking ahead to 585 BC, he makes a prophecy about what the Babylonians, not the Assyrians, would do. And he says it's coming against the temple of the Lord. Hence, he is not just prophesying for his own time, he's prophesying for future time. And it also has nuances or repercussions for the events of 70 AD. Now, as we've said multiple times, we interpret the Old Testament in light of the New, and the New Testament tells us the temple of the Lord is the church. We're told this seven times in the New Testament using the Greek terms Heron, Oikos Hegios being the holy house, Heron being, being of course, temple, Naos being sanctuary. But clearly, seven times, the church is called the temple. Hosea is warning, making prophecies, like all of Israel's prophets. He's prophesying for his own time. He's prophesying for the first coming of Christ. And he's prophesying for the close of the age. 70 AD would have the meaning for the first coming of Christ. However, he does something else. He not only prophesies for his own time, but he prophesies for the interim period between his own time and the first coming of Christ. He gives a prophecy concerning what would happen in the days of Jeremiah, a prophecy concerning the events surrounding the destruction of the first temple, not the ones in 720 in his own time. That's the northern tribe, but the actual temple in Jerusalem of 585. And it set the trumpet to thy lips. Now, not thy mouth, thy lips. And it says that for a reason. It emphasizes that for a reason. The lips, if, as anybody who plays a trumpet or a trob trombone will tell you, it's in the lips. The positioning of the lips affects the sound. You can control the notes, perhaps with uh, your fingers on certain instruments. But in biblical times, when you had a shofar, there were no, there was no finger action. There was only muffling. The size of the shofar or ram's horn itself, but it was the lips. Variations in tone, variations in uh, volume would be controlled by the lips. This is important for a reason. It's because the trumpet was used for different reasons and different signals diff with different tones, different lengths of the trumpet blasts. Uh, 
and different volumes all meant different things. The instrument had to be played not with the fingers like a modern trumpet, but with the lips. Now, before we go any further, let's understand something that many Christians have never really considered. Most people understand the trumpet to be a ram's horn, a shofar, like in the Battle of Jericho with Joshua. It is a ram's horn. Uh, it's a shofar. It's what it is, is a ram's horn. Uh, I've got one somewhere, but that's what it is. That's all it is. Let me see if I can get one. This is a shofar. This is a ram's horn. This one actually comes from Israel. But the person who blows a ram's horn in Judaism is known as the Baal Tekuah. The Baal Tekuah. He is the master of the blowing. The master of the blowing. And before the Feast of Tekuah, now called the Jewish New Year, but it was not in scripture, that is Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, he would be practicing, practicing using his lips to get the exact signals of the exact length of the exact audio volume. And he'd be doing this for about a week to 10 days before the actual feast itself. He would be practicing blowing the shofar, but it would all be lip action. I used to be better at it in my youth. <laughs> and so forth and so forth. Some people are really good at it. I was once better at it. But it was all the action of the lips. It was used for multiple purposes. And you use different intonations, different lengths of the blast, and different amplification volume to get the signal that you wanted to send out for the purpose for which you were using it. Now, this is not to be confused with something else. Look with me, please, to the book of Numbers, chapter 10. Numbers chapter 10. The Lord spoke in verse 1 to Moses, make yourself two trumpets of silver of hammered work, you shall make them, and you shall use them for summoning the congregation and for having the camps set out. Notice for having the camps set out. We have a recorded teaching on the Moriel website on the silver trumpets, the silver trumpets. Obviously, the horn of a ram is not a silver trumpet. They were two very different instruments that sounded very different. One was a brass instrument and one was simply a horn from a ram. They sounded quite different. Whenever we look at a biblical text and there are 64 uses in the scripture of a trumpet, we must understand from the original language in Hebrew, what was a shofar, a ram's horn, and what was a silver trumpet. In the New Testament, in Greek, however, we only have one word, one word, interestingly enough, be it a shofar, be it a silver trumpet, or be it a bugle that occurs in Corinthians. The word is always solapigo, solapigo. So we get the differentials or the different kinds of horns, different kinds of trumpets 
from the Old Testament. What is the difference between the shofar and the ram's horn and the silver trumpet? That is called the Hatsutra Kesef. Hatsutra Kesef. Kesef meaning silver, but also meaning money. What is the difference? Well, the trumpet of the rapture, for instance, it's the signal to set out, we read in Numbers. The last trumpet blown by an angel in 1 Corinthians 15 in the resurrection chapter at the last trumpet, the dead in Christ rise. That is not a ram's horn, a shofar. That would correspond to a silver trumpet, to a Hatsutra. Why? It was the signal to set out. It is the rapture. It is the rapture and the resurrection. Get out of here. Now notice, this is a horn or a wind instrument, a trumpet blown by an angel, not by a man. In the New Testament, Whenever you see an angel blowing, it corresponds to the Hat Sutra. It is this that we can be sure of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But because it's the same word, Salapigo, we can't be 100% positive about the seven trumpets in the book of Revelation chapter 8. It's just that there is no precedent for an angel blowing a ram's horn. So it would appear to be that they could be silver trumpets or were most likely metallic instruments. But you, you can't be 100% dogmatic. Nonetheless, let's understand what's happening here. When people are told to set the trumpet to your lips, it's God wanting us to do something. It's God wanting us to do something. When it's the silver trumpets in the New Testament, borrowed from the book of Numbers, it is God doing something to which he wants us to respond. With the shofar, the signal comes from man. With the silver trumpet, the signal comes from the Lord, the Hatsutra. Okay, now let's continue looking at this. Turn with me, please, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 27, verse 13. It'll come about on that day that a great trumpet will be blown and those who were perishing in the land of Assyria and who were scattered in the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord in the holy mountain. Now that has a future prophetic meaning for both Israel and the nations. Nonetheless, let's understand why the shofar was blown. Convocation, assembly, it was a signal to gather. This is common in the book of Isaiah. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 18, verse 3. All you inhabitants of the world, and dwellers on the earth, as soon as the standard is raised on the mountain, you will see it. And as soon as the trumpet is blown, you will hear it. You will hear it. The Lord sends his envoys. It has something to do with gathering. With gathering Israel or with gathering the nations. Now, 
a command to gather, to assemble? Yes. But it is also blown with a different purpose and a different gathering. Look with me to Jeremiah chapter 51, please. The fall of Babylon chapter. And we are told remarkably in this passage, in verse 27, lift up a signal in the land, blow the trumpet among the nations. Notice it's not just Israel. Consecrate the nations against her. Summon against her the kingdoms of Ararat, mean the Ashkenaz, which is in Europe. Appoint a marshal against her. Bring up the horses of the bristly locusts. Consecrate the nations against her, the kings of the Medes, etc., for the purpose of the Lord against Babylon, to make the land of Babylon a desolation without inhabitants. It is a summons for war, a summons for war. God will bring the nations against his enemies, but he will also bring the nations against his own people in judgment. Let's look a bit further. So we have it as a signal to gather. It could be a signal for Israel to gather, but it could be a signal for the nations to gather, the nations to gather for the purposes of God. What else are we told? Obviously, it's an alarm. Look with me, please, to the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 15. Yoel Hanavi, something we looked at in our midweek Bible studies recently, the book of Joel. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. The impending destruction of Jerusalem and of the Temple Mount by the Babylonians blow a trumpet in Zion, the invasion of Nebuchadnezzar, which prefigures the events of Revelation chapter 9. I would point you back to the videos on the Moriel channel from the book of Joel, where we go into this in more depth, if you were not with us a few weeks ago for the midweek Bible study. What is this saying? It is saying that it is a warning a warning that an impending disaster is looming. We also looked at this a couple of months ago in the book of Zephaniah, chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Zephaniah, chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. In Zephaniah, chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, it is an, a warning an alarm that the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord is coming, or it is at hand. The day of the Lord being the time of his wrath. Okay. So we see it can be blown as a signal to gather. It can be blown as a signal of warning. But how else can it be blown? Let's continue to look. First Kings chapter one, verse 34. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him there as king over Israel and blow the trumpet and say, long live King Solomon. Crowning happened 
but not regularly. The crowning was for the King Messiah. The kings of Israel and Judah, particularly of Judah, were anointed, not so much as crowned, they were generally anointed. And when the rightful king had been anointed, the shofar, the trumpets were blown in a distinct note telling the people it happened, making it an official proclamation. We see this when Jehu became king after Elisha anointed him. The trumpet was blown, Jehu was king. But when it was a king that Athaliah didn't like, the trumpet was blown, she went on the warpath. So it always has to do something with the anointing of the rightful king. Now, in the Old Testament is always a shadow of the new. The Old Testament is a shadow of the new. It's fulfilled in Christ. When you see the anointing of a rightful king in the Old Testament, it is a picture of the anointing of Christ. That's what Messiah means. That's what Christ means. Moshiach, Messiah, the anointed one. The anointing of kings like David at Hebron by Samuel and the anointing here of Solomon by Nathan, they were shadows, types of the anointing of the ultimate righteous king and right king, Yeshua, Jesus. Okay, so it has to do with the establishment of a reign, the establishment of a reign of a right king. Let's go through it again. A warning, a gathering, a proclamation of a reign. What else is it? Look with me, please, to Ezekiel 33, 1 to 6. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the sons of your people and say to them, if I bring a sword upon the land and the people of the land take one man from among them and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming upon the land and he blows on the trumpet and warns the people, then he who hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take the warning and a sword comes and takes him away, his blood will be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet but he did not take warning. His blood will be on himself. But had he taken warning, he would have delivered his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes a person from them, he's taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require from the watchman's hands. Now, as for you, son of man, I've appointed you a watchman of the house of Israel. You will hear a message from my mouth and give the warning for me. When I say to the wicked, oh, wicked man, you shall surely die. And you don't warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. But if you on your part warn a wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he will die in his iniquity. But you have delivered your life. Now as for you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, thus you have spoken, saying, surely our transgression and our sins are upon us, and we are rotting away in them. How then can we survive? But as I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn back 
from his way and live. Turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? Now again, Israel and the Jews are a microcosm of humanity. They are, of course, in a covenant relationship with God, but they teach about the human race. Okay. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God is not a Calvinist. He does not create people in order to torture them forever. Even when people go into moral reprobation, idolatry, God would far prefer that they repent. But they must hear a trumpet to repent. They must be warned. Now, this resembles what Paul said in the book of Acts, chapters 19 and 20, at his farewell address from the believers and the leaders at the church of Ephesus. I thank God no one's blood will be required at my hands. The trumpet represents warning of God's judgment coming against the unrepentant. If the trumpet is blown by those who see his judgment coming and they still don't repent, that's down to them. God's word will not return void. It'll either count for their judgment or bring them to a conviction and a repentance, but it will not return void. Once the trumpet is blown, it's for them to respond. But if the trumpet is not blown, the ones who fails to blow the trumpet are culpable for their blood. If we are not warning the unsaved about the nature of the judgments that are coming, both as a general truth that will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and they're either going to be found vindicated because of his blood, or they're going to be found culpable. That's a general truth. That's evangelism. Every unsaved person we meet is on their way to hell. And we have the message to stop them from getting there. But in times when judgment is impending, such as the time in which we live, and we see what's coming. Remember, Habakkuk stood on the watchtower. We see what's coming. The faithful church sees what's coming. The faithful church knows why we see certain things happening. Why the rise of radical Islam and the countries that were at the center of world events in the scripture, at the center of world events again, that is not a coincidence. Faithful believers know that. Why is Israel reborn as a nation? and Jews turning to faith in Christ again. Faithful believers know that. You can watch the video clips. In Israel, unless you have the vaccination, you will not get an ID button, and you cannot go into a shopping mall or a supermarket. Nobody can buy or sell without the button. Is that the mark of the beast? No. But is it paving the way for the mark of the beast? Absolutely. The pressure on taking the vaccination <clears throat> creates a template, as I said on the catching up this week, that is eventually going to have a, a template, there'll be a template to take the mark. We see these things happening. We see these things coming. We are told to preach the gospel of the kingdom, to warn the unsaved about these things. Even unsaved people are having their attention caught 
by the nature of world events. We are to tell them what these events mean, that the judgment of God is coming, that an antichrist is coming. We need to tell them. We need to blow the trumpet. If we fail to blow the trumpet, God will hold us accountable for their blood. This is very, very serious. The trumpet is emblematic of warning and warning the unsaved to repent, as it were, evangelism. Let's look further. Judges chapter 6, verses 33 and 34. All the Midianites and the Amalekites, the sons of the east, assembled themselves and crossed over and camped in the valley of Jezreel. Notice the valley of Jezreel. The valley of Jezreel is the real name of the valley of Armageddon. We've explained before that Armageddon does not exist. It is not a valley. Armageddon comes from a transliteration of Har Megiddo, Har Megiddo, the Mount of Megiddo. Not the valley, it's a mount, Har Megiddo. Armageddon comes from a transliteration. Underneath Megiddo is the valley that separates Samaria from Galilee, this huge valley where many military disasters in Israel's history took place and where Napoleon Bonaparte stood on Mount Tabor, looked down and said, this is the perfect place for my ultimate military campaign. This is Jezreel. Whenever you see a military conflict being spoken of in Jezreel, it hints at something from Revelation 16 or from the book of, I'm sorry, the, from the book of Revelation or from the book of Zechariah or Revelation 16, the battle of Armageddon, as the people wrongly call it. It's the battle of Har Megiddo. The valley is Jezreel. And so it goes on and he tells them these things. It's coming, it's happening, and so forth. But we are told that it is a call to battle, a call to battle in Judges 6, 33 and 34. They crossed over and camped in the Valley of Jezreel. So the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and the Avirazites were called together to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout Manasseh. And they were called together to follow him also. And he sent messengers to the tribes of Asher, Zebulun, Naphtali, and came up to meet him. Okay. There was going to be a summons for battle. A summons for battle. Look with me, please, to the book of Amos, chapter 3, verse 6. If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people tremble? If a calamity occurs in a city, 
Has the Lord not done it? You have the warning, and then you have its use for a battle. Two different signals using the same instrument. Let's continue. So Gideon, Gideon summons the people for battle. But let's look at something. Turn with me, please, to the book of Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 14. Ezekiel 7, 14. They have blown the trumpet, made everything ready, but no one's going to battle. My wrath is against their multitude. Oh boy. The signal goes up, but they don't want to fight. Let's look at this further. Turn with me, please, to the book of Job, chapter 39. Job, chapter 39, verses 24 and 25. With the shaking and rage, he races over the ground. He doesn't stand still at the voice of the trumpet. As often as the trumpet sounds, he says, aha, and he scents the battle from afar and a thunder of the captains and the war cry. The same as you have people who hear the warning signal of the trumpet and will not heed the warning and repent. You have people who will hear the battle cry of the trumpet but they will not attack. They hear the sound, but they will not go. Let's look at this a bit further. Turn with me, please, to 2 Samuel chapter 20, verse 1. Now a worthless fellow happened to be there whose name was Sheba, the son of Bikri, a Benjamite. And he blew the trumpet and said, we have no portion in David, nor do we have inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So the men of Israel withdrew from following David. Not every trumpet sound is from the Lord. There are those who will counterfeit the trumpet sound or they will blow a false sound. They got the people from following David, the type of the Messiah. Let's look at this again, 2 Samuel 15, 10. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes. And as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpets, you shall say, Absalom is the king in Hebron. Now, I won't go into it now, but Absalom attempts to usurp the throne of his father David. 
Uh, he's a type of the Antichrist. We deal with this in our book, Shadows of the Beast. But notice, the same as when the trumpet is sounded, denoting the reign of the rightful king, the trumpet is sounded denoting the reign of the wrong one. You need to understand those signals. Well, before we continue, let's put this back together. One more thing, though. Psalm 150, verse 3. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with harp and lyre, with timbrel, stringed instruments and pipe. The shofar is used to praise the Lord. It is used as an instrument of praise. So it can be used as an instrument of praise. It can be used as an instrument of a signal to gather, to convocate. It can be used as a signal to attack. It can be used as a signal of warning. It can be used for all of these things, to warn, to attack, to establish the reign of a king, to gather, to organize to worship. It's no good setting it to your mouth. When you put a shofar to your mouth, nothing happens. You're just blowing air to a horn, to a hollow horn, that's all. Nothing's gonna happen. We are told Set the trumpet to your lips. Know which signal to give, how to give it, and when to give it. <coughs> Is it attack? Is it gather? Is it warning? Is it the establishment of the righteous reign? Is it worship? What is it? What is it? If there's anything we need to do in these days in which we live, it's to set the trumpet to our lips. Setting it to our mouth is pointless. Setting it to our lips is how you learn how to play it. On the lips, it's an instrument. Just in the mouth, it's a hollow horn. It means nothing. It sheathes nothing, it does nothing. Now let's recap this before we move on. We must understand the difference in the Hebrew canon between a Hatsutra and a Shofar, that is a ram's horn. The Hatsutra, the silver trumpets, have them represent an angelic signaling, an angelic signaling. The Shofar has to do with us signaling. Secondly, and that's just preliminary, of course. It is a warning, a warning of impending doom, judgment, calamity. Something is happening. 
We're told in Luke there will be fear and anxiety among the nations, none of them knowing the way out. The tide of prophetic events that have to take place before the Lord comes, as we realize, has gained momentum not only in the last 20 years, but in the last 20 months. A time will come when it will gather momentum in 20 weeks. The closer we get to the Lord's return, the faster these things will happen. I'm not an alarmist. I'm not a date setter. But I do know we need to set the trumpet to our mouths. Even unsaved people realize something is happening. We can tell them what it is. Secondly, we know that that trumpet is going to be blown to establish and proclaim the reign of the righteous king. A better world is coming. Even before eternity, a better world is coming. The millennial reign of Jesus. As I always say, if an older Christian, a sick Christian, is diagnosed terminally ill, and they're given six months to live by their physicians. Assuming the diagnosis is right and the prognosis is right, and assuming God does not intervene, it's still wrong. A believer never has six months to live. A believer always has 1,000 plus six months to live. We will be physically alive on the earth in bodies that do not age and do not become ill. We will have bodies akin to the resurrected body of Jesus and the world will return to its Adamic state for a thousand years. Again, I only mention this briefly, but understand this trumpet is going to be blown to proclaim the reign of the righteous king. What a wonderful sound that will be. Let's continue. It is a sound to attack. Work while you have the light. Night will come, no man can work. Our response to the way the world is going, our response to the avalanche of evil, we see overtaking society and invading the church is not a bunker mentality. Batten down the hatches and wait for the Lord to come. Oh, it'll come to that. But in the meantime, we're called to fight. We're called to attack. Our sister Hatun Tash was knifed in the face at Speaker's Corner last week. What a brave lady preaching the gospel to Muslims. They knifed her in the face and tried to kill her for proclaiming Jesus to Muslims. Was she hiding in a bunker? No. She was on the attack. We are to be on the attack when the trumpet sounds. Rise of radical Islam, rise of militant homosexuality, rise of vehement abortion, rise of corruption in government. We are to attack. The early Christians were brutally persecuted, but they attacked our weapon being the gospel, the sword. But there will be those that when the trumpet is sounded, they will not attack. I've seen many, many situations where the church was invaded. Isaiah says, we have to repel the onslaught at the gate. It's getting into the church. And people will say, when you warn about false teachers and false prophets, 
oh, we just have to love, not judge. God doesn't want us to criticize. We just have to love Benny N and Kenneth Copeland. We just have to love, you know, Paula White. We just have to love and accept them as brethren. The world will believe by our love. That's not love. That's refusing to respond to the trumpet. People don't want to evangelize. Some do. Many, many Christians do not. God says, I'll require that blood of your hands. You don't blow that trumpet and warn them. Oh, they'll perish all right. But I'm holding you responsible for not blowing the trumpet. The Lord is going to ask us, did you blow the trumpet? Not just set it to your mouth. Set it to your lips and blow the right signal at the right time. Now, if they don't respond to the warning, or if they refuse to attack, that's down to them. But if we don't blow it, that is down to us. And yes, there will be bad people blowing the trumpet, sending false signals. There will be rebellion in the church worse than what it already is. I've always known that up to a point, the antichrist and false prophet are going to be able to deceive many people who profess to be born again. Many. Don't worry. They will have taken a lot of trumpet lessons. We have to know. Now there's one more thing we need to close with from the New Testament. Salapigo in Greek. Look with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 8. First Corinthians 14, 8. <clears throat> For if the bugle, the trumpet, the solapigo produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? Before the age of computer handsets and radio transmission, Army signaled with flags, with ensigns, and they signaled them battle with a trumpet. Different melodies meant different things. Of course, the British and the Americans have their own version of it, but it goes back to the Romans. In fact, it probably goes back to Philip of Macedonia, to the, to the father of Alexander the Great. You know from the movies, charge! Whatever. Recall! Taps, go to sleep! Wake up! Get ready! Assemble! Get up! Same instrument. Play different ways with different lip action. Confusing signal is disaster. I pointed this out once. 
One of the things that made the American Civil War such a calamity, causing so many more casualties than there would have been in certain battles early in the war, particularly places like Antietam in Maryland, was this. The Northern Army and the Southern Army, the Confederacy and the Union, were both Americans. Their officers were both educated at either West Point or the Virginia Military Institute, basically, or something like that. They had the same ranks, the same protocols, and they had the same bugle signals. So the Union troops could hear the Confederate signals and respond to their own signal. The Confederates could hear the Union signals, thinking it was for them, and respond to the wrong signal. The confusion on the battlefield was unbelievable. Again, Absalom's men used the shofar to blow the signal that confused the people. Bad people blew the signal. The enemy can blow the signal to bring confusion in the battle. This requires a keen ear. In other words, it requires discernment and knowledge of the scripture above all. Without that knowledge of the scripture and without discernment, you're not going to know where the signal is coming from. It'll sound real. It'll sound genuine, bona fide, authentic, but it's the wrong signal. Could be coming from the enemy to confuse, to bring chaos, pandemonium. Combat is, if nothing else, a confused, chaotic situation under the best of conditions. Trying to maintain order in it is not easy. What signal are you responding to? Well, I heard the trumpet. Yeah, but who was playing it? These hype artist money preachers, these crazy women, Paula White in these ones. <laughs> well, they all got a trumpet. They rant and rave, some of them. But it's a trumpet in the hand of an infiltrator, of a wolf in sheep's clothing, of a false prophet, a false teacher, of a whatever, a backslidden religious con artist. Who knows? But they can play the trumpet. The confusion. It's got to be a clear signal. Is it gather, convocate? Is it warning, take heed? Is it attack? Is it worship? Establishment of a reign. It could be any of those things, any of those things. Now the angels from heaven with the silver trumpets, they're gonna hit all the right notes at the right time, at the right volume. They're not gonna make any mistakes. They've been practicing a long time. We can make mistakes. Paul particularly applies this in Corinthians to the exercise of charismatic gifts. Is it a prophecy or a false prophecy? Is it a word of knowledge or is it clairvoyance? Is it tongues or is it gibberish? A confused signal. 
You have to learn how to play it. You have to learn how to hear it. You look at a professional musician, somebody like one of the jazz greats, somebody like, like Dizzy Gillespie or, or, or Louis Armstrong or, or Benny Goodman, the slightest deviation, the slightest, slightest tonal deviation, they'd pick it up immediately. A wrong note, <laughs> that'd be completely obvious. This should be fortissimo or something, like a French horn in a Philharmonic Orchestra. The conductor can hear. Is that really fortissimo? You can't blow it until you know how to hear it. It doesn't say blow it. It says play it. Not set it to your mouth. <sighs> set it to your lips. The Lord is coming. He's placed us here at this time for a purpose. World events are moving at an increasingly fast pace. There's a lot of confusion, a lot of wrong signals, a lot of bad people blowing trumpets, a lot of good people who don't know how to distinguish the sounds, the notes. They don't know the difference. Well, one thing is for sure, as Cassius Clay used to say, if you don't see sharp, you're going to be flat. Boy, was he right about that. Wrong about everything else, but he was sure right about that. If you don't see sharp, you're going to be flat. If there's one thing we need. If there's one thing the church needs now, it is music lessons. We need to learn how to play this thing. We need to know what signal to give, when and how to give it, and what the false signals are. Our signals must be clear unambiguous and distinct. We need to learn how to play this thing. Our signals must be clear, unambiguous, and distinct. We need to know what signals to send, when to send them. And we need to know who is sending out false signals. Is it set the trumpet to thy mouth? No friends, it is not setting the trumpet to our mouths. It is setting the trumpet to our lips. God bless and thank you so much for listening. I hope you can join us this coming week for a midweek Bible study. Uh, we're continuing looking at the book of Philippians. We begin with Philippians 1 this Thursday. See you next week here on Word for the Weekend. Have a great weekend. Blessings in Jesus.